Hey gang, we are in Portsmouth, New Hampshire today, very early morning. We're at Harmony Grove Cemetery, a very ancient cemetery here in this very historic town. And we are going to visit the grave of, of two women who were murdered by axe and strangulation. I want to first start out by letting you know that I found out about this by reading a really, really good book. The author's name is J. Dennis Robinson. And I think uh, the title, Isle, Isles of Shoals, Closing the Case of the Smutty Nose Axe Murderer, uh, something like that. I'll put, the, I'll put the book up here and I will put the link in the description box. But the reason I recommend it is there was a movie made about this. I think it was called The Weight of Water and another author. And it's filled with a bunch of malarkey. And the book really sets the record straight on really, we're going to talk about the real story of what happened out on this island. Island's about 10 miles out from Portsmouth. It's actually on the border of the main side, which is Isles of Shoals, all these islands. And it's uh, one of these outer islands, I think, to the north and on the main side. Very small, barren island where this horrible this horrifying event took place back in the 1870s and the way the author describes it well I got to give him a lot of credit first because he was the it maybe still is but for many many years the caretaker the seasonal caretaker on the island and if anyone would know the history it was driving him nuts that there's a lot of conspiracy theories and the story and he it's a really good book trust me I don't know him I'm not getting any money, but you know, when I shout out a book here, which isn't too often, it's, it's worthwhile for, uh, for you guys to, uh, to check it out. Anyway, let's take a walk. Let's walk to the two women's graves that were murdered, and we'll look at some things on the way, which, uh, well, this is an absolute amazing place, as you can already see, of many, many old gravestones and, well, a lot of history here. So yeah, the ex murders of the Smutty Nose. So let me tell you a little bit first about the Smutty Nose Island of the chain. Tiny little island, it's about 10 miles off, as I said. And as part of that group of islands called the Isles of Shoals and it's just a bunch of seagulls there, as Dennis tells it. It's all, almost all rocks. Looks prehistoric. 
and it is actually where the Native Americans were 6,000 years ago. And several hundred years ago, it started to become a place for fishermen. And they would, you know, 10 miles out, it's not easy to get to, especially with the tides. Well, depending on the tides, we're going to talk about that. The story actually begins in Norway in the 1860s, where a man named John Huntfett married a woman named Marin Christensen. It was late in the 1860s, they emigrated from there to America. They initially lived in Boston, and they were saving up their money there. John was a fisherman. And it was early in the 1870s that John and Marin were able to get out of Boston finally and ended up on this island we're going to be talking about, the Smutty Nose Island which is an island that got its name from old fishermen who would look across and see the seaweed in the horizon. It just looked like, well, I'm going to call it like a snotty nose. <laughs> There's other old names for it, but that's basically what you get. Now, when the Hunfets arrived, the island was barren and all that had been there before it was gone. There were some operations there. And it turned out that John Huntfett was a very successful fisherman. He had a very innovative way of fishing. Now, most of the guys that would be out there, and again, they would row. He had a small schooner, you know, with a sail, but a lot of these guys would use these rowboats called dories, and they'd have a single hook. And, you know, just like most of us fish. But he had an innovative way of doing it. He had like a thousand hooks on a real long line and had like glass, I don't know, floats, call them bobbers. And he would, he would bait all these at the same time and set them out, right? So he would catch a huge load of fish at every outing that he would make. So he did pretty well. He was very, very successful. He was making money and he was able to then hire some people. And one of the guys he hired was a 28-year-old Prussian. Now Prussian back then, today that's German. Germany. That's a guy that he'd gotten to know. His name was Louis Wagner. He just hired him for one season, 1872. And old Lewis, he was a pretty good looking guy, strapping and strong. Everybody seemed to like him. He had a good personality. He was kind of a ladies' man, no surprise. But he was pretty lazy. And working on the island, working in the boats, he would kind of sit around a lot, fake rheumatism. He really didn't like to work, so that was kind of like, oh, I can't work today. My rheumatism is acting up. And Marin would kind of coddle him, John's wife. But I think they were kind of seeing through that, like, oh, this we got to get rid of this guy at some point. So the next year, as was common, family would come. I mean, that's the way it worked. You know, coming from Norway or other European countries to America, you'd send, you know, the man would come first, kind of establish himself, and then the rest of the family would follow. And in this case, Marin's sister, Karen, came. She would end up working on the hotel on the next island over, but near at the same time, Marin's young brother and sister-in-law, Ivan and Annetta, they also came to the island, and there was no room for Mr. Wagner, so they had to boot him off. He got his one year of work, and he was sent back to Portsmouth. Now, it is said that Annetta had golden hair down to her knees. She was very beautiful. So we have Annetta, we have her husband Ivan, and then there's also John's brother Matthew who came. So everybody's on the island, everybody's chipping in. 
and they were all living in the hunt fed house. The house was divided into a few rooms, maybe three rooms. I think there was an upstairs. The building's gone, by the way. It's not there anymore. So Louis Wagner goes back to Portsmouth and he ends up living in a low-end flop house with three other fishermen. He's pretty much penniless, runs out of money, very unhappy. They're all impoverished. And they're really living in a crap area, probably the worst part of town. So he's not doing well, and he's probably a little bit ticked off. Now, on March 5th, 1873, Lewis is at the Portsmouth docks as John, Ivan, and Matthew come sailing in on their little schooner. And they're coming in. Why are they coming in? Well, they've got their nifty hook technique, but they need a lot of bait. And I guess the bait comes in from Boston. You know, this isn't just one little minnow, or in this case, I think they use clams, cut up clams. They need a whole bunch for all these hooks. And there, conveniently standing on the dock, helping to pull in the boat lines, is Lewis. Hey, guys. Great to see you. How you been? What have you been doing? And now Lewis is kind of really curious because, you know, he knows that John and gang are, have been pretty successful. And he's like, hey, where are the women? Well, they're on the island. They're on the island by themselves? Why did you, why would you leave them by themselves? He's like, John's like, they'll be fine. What are you talking about? They're Norwegian. And how did you do? Are you making money? Yeah, we did really well this year. I mean, John has no idea. He's not suspecting anything. And he tells him, I think he made 600 and some bucks. And you, you could just imagine how Lewis's eyes, Lewis of Wagner, his eyes just absolutely lit up like a Christmas tree. So what happened? Well, Lewis says, hey, I'll be right back and I'll, I'll come back and I'll help you bait all your thousand hooks. Hey, that's great, Lewis, see you in a bit. Well, Lewis doesn't come back. He does not come back. Their lines are baited and the guys, they, they're not gonna be able to make it back to Smutty Nose that night, so they decide to lay over, stay the night in Portsmouth. It's dark. And in the whole meantime here, Lewis slips down to the river and he steals a dory. Now a dory is like a big wooden rowboat. And it's a nice streamlined rowboat. And he proceeds to, under the cover of darkness, under the moonlight, proceeds to row out to Smutty Nose. Now, this is another thing in the book that is kind of set straight. First of all, the tides, the tides here come flying out. I think, I don't think you have to even row to get three miles out and then you have to start rowing. And again, Lewis, that's what he does for a living. He's a dory fisherman, one hook at a time. So he's like rowing every day. This is what this guy does. He rows out there, he gets to the island and he sees the women, he sees the lights and he hides out. He waits like, well, I'm going to wait for them to go to bed, and then I'm going to get my hands on that money. I'm going to get that money in the trunk. And I'll take the trunk, and I will just, I'll just get out of here. No one, no one will even know. So he waits, and he waits. Now, what he doesn't know, he thinks it's just Marin and Annetta, but what he doesn't know is Karen is there. And Karen is actually sleeping in the kitchen. And the 
Two other women are in the bedroom. And he finally decides that now is the time, now is the time to make my move. And of course, he tries to sneak in the door. He gets inside and what he does is he puts like a twig, like a piece of kindling and locks the bedroom door so ostensibly the women that are sleeping there can't get out while he's going to fumble for the, the trunk and steal it. But he runs right into Karen in the kitchen and she jumps up and she's like, you know, and she thinks it's John. She's like, John is back or the guys are back and he freaks out. So he starts, he takes a chair and starts smashing her. She starts screaming, John, John, what are you doing? And, you know, he's bashing the crap out of her. And meanwhile, as he's smashing her, she falls against the door and the, the little kindling twig falls out. And that opens the door. And I got, she falls in the bedroom and then all the three women are there and he's bashing her and in the pandemonium, Marin says to Annetta, jump out the window, find a boat, find some help, do, do whatever you can. She jumps out the window and Lewis sees this and he runs outside to get her. He's like, I gotta, I gotta kill these women because they're gonna know who I am. I mean, otherwise it would have been fine. So he, he goes out there and he, he reaches down, he sees there's an ax there is an ax that is sitting there in the ice bucket and it's for, you know, chopping ice and getting water. He grabs that and he just starts chopping away and smashing Annetta out there. Now Marin is watching this. Karen's on the floor. Karen is really, really in a bad way. And she, she can barely move. She's already bashed up. Marin's like, man, I don't know what to do, but she looks outside and she is witnessing Annetta getting hatcheted to death, screaming. So Marin's like, Karen, we got to get out of here. And Karen's like, I can't do it. I cannot move. I'm, you go. And that was the hardest thing she had to do was leave her sister, but she did. Because here comes Lewis. He looks in the window and he's like, I got to get those two. So he goes in there and Marin, I think, went out the window and he starts to finish off Karen. So Marin is now alone. She was able to grab her little dog, a blanket. I don't even think she had shoes on. She was in her nightgown. Now remember, this is like snow. The island's covered in snow, it's freezing, it's probably in the 30s, if not the 20s. And she's got to go hide. So she goes out there and she's like in the snow and she hides in a strategic place that is today called Marin's Rock. I think Dennis said in his book that there is a rock there that you can go see. And she hides there and she listens to her sister being killed. Can you imagine? The whole time. Listens to her get killed. And then he comes looking for her. He spends probably an hour or two walking the whole island because they found his footprints the next day in the snow. Bloody boot prints. And that's another thing on the conspiracy theory why that doesn't add up. But he doesn't find her. The dog stays quiet and she successfully evades him by keeping very still. So he goes in the house. He found $16. It's about all he could find. He didn't find the trunk or the money. Maybe it was hidden in the sheets. And he eats some food and he takes off. He's out of there. And now he knows you know there's still one witness that's alive. I have got to get the heck out of here. So what does he do? He gets back in his dory. The tide was probably coming back towards Portsmouth and these are really big tides. 
and he rose back. I think there was a total of 11 hours for him to commit this crime. Totally enough time, especially for a guy like that. And already, you know, looking later, witnesses are seeing him. He doesn't come up the main river here. He goes down a, another area. And these are people that don't know him, but witness him, this bloody guy that's a mess. And he's just trying to get back. He, he abandons the stolen boat. And he's just trying to get back to, you know, he's, he's trying to get back to a place where he can clean up and then get the heck out of there, which is what he did. So, of course, Marin comes out the next day in the morning, and she ends up flagging a fisherman down. And again, then the horror is basically uncovered. And the fisherman gets her back to the family. And the next thing you know, the whole town hears. And it's, it's an uproar. And in fact, it was like an immediate lynch mob was looking for this guy, this Lewis. Now, he had cleaned up. He had made his way to Boston. And the short story is that they caught up with him. They brought him back. They had to really work hard not to let him get lynched. And he sat in jail and they had the trial. And of course he was found guilty. A very narcissistic guy. He was loving the attention actually. And of course professing his innocence the whole time. Well, they got him. They got him on all the charges and, of course, guilty and sentenced to hang. And one of the nights before his sentence was carried out, he got away. He escaped jail. I guess it wasn't too hard in those days. And he got caught, of course, and he said, Oh no, I wasn't trying to escape. I just wanted to see some of the ladies. I wanted to visit some of the ladies who visited me while I was in jail because they're so nice. And I'm infatuated with them. Okay, buddy. He was, he was a really good liar. Well, of course, he got hung. And that's pretty much the end of the story, Marin survived. And Lizzie Borden happened about 10 years later, I think. And I think that's when some of the conspiracy theories started. And sadly, she had to live with that. People accusing, oh, maybe, of course, you know, it kind of started with Lewis in jail, you know, oh, Marin did it. I didn't do it. But once the Lizzie Borden thing happened, then in you know, by then it was known all over the country, all over the world as a famous case. And they started to say, oh, maybe Marin did it. And to this day, this is kind of the story. And that's where Dennis, that's where Dennis kind of sets things straight. And I think it's awesome that he did it. And he should know. Because he lives on the island. He's a history nut. So here we are. We are at Annetta's grave and Karen's grave. Sister of Marin and the wife of Ivan. And there's flowers here. It looks like these stones have been cleaned up pretty well. You can see they're marble. And again, I'm not a fan of this. I, you know, we've walked through this entire cemetery and my own personal opinion, I'm gonna go on my rant again. This looks beautiful. It's like patina on a penny. And you just kind of ruin it when you, when you do that. But it's do-gooders, people with good intentions, I get it. But what you're doing, guys, is every time you take a layer off. And I know the lichen, yeah, it's got acids. But you know, if you weigh and balance, when time you scrape all that stuff off, you've done more damage. Anyway. These are beautiful stones, they're maintained. Let's take a closer look. Annetta, wife of 
Ivan spelled, no, maybe, you know, in, I know it's Ivan, but maybe it's pronounced differently. Now, I'm half Swedish and I'm half German, but I don't know how to pronounce that, so in comments, E-V-E-N Christensen. Born in Norway, October 1st, 1847, and died March 6th, 1873, that fateful day, or I should say night. Well, it might have been one in the morning. Karen Ann Christensen, born in Norway also, June 13th, 1833, and she, of course, died on that famous day, March 6, 1873. There are some prayers underneath. And here they rest in, in peace and solitude. This is a very quiet place. And we shall leave a flower for each of them, as we try to do. Well, there it is. That's the story, guys. The story of the axe murders of, of Smutty Nose Island. Aneta and Karen Ann, rest in peace.